Great. So Keith Humphreys, my good friend and my go-to source on uh, substance abuse policy and health reform and many other subjects. It's uh, a pleasure to talk to you. Good to see you, man. So uh, I thought we would talk today and about how health reform is important for people with mental health or substance use disorders, uh, a little bit of the history of that, why health reform is it's really more important in this field than most people understand, and also some of the challenges that we've got uh, ahead. Does that sound like a good agenda? Sure does. So maybe we could start by you introducing yourself and saying all the wonderful things about you. Uh, first, what should, tell me about your current uh, employment status. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine, uh, although I'm a clinical psychologist by training, not a psychiatrist. And then I'm also a career research scientist in the VA, and I've done a lot of work on the VA system, which is one of the, actually in the public sector, is probably the largest integrated system for care for people for mental health and substance use. It treats about a million people a year. I do, I, I do research, you know, like most professors, I teach, I have, I teach clinical methods, and then I do a lot of work, as you know, with policymakers in the U.S. and in other countries. And tell me a little bit about the kinds of patients that uh, that come through the Stanford VA and and uh, the issues that you, that you confront on the sort of clinical side of things. There's been, you know, at, at the at the moment, I'm not directly treating patients. I'm still doing supervisions and, and teaching. So so what I see is there's been a, a big change with these two recent wars in the VA. So the the you know the veterans uh, of the you know Vietnam era, a lot of heroin use, a lot of alcohol use. Um, they're they're kind of older now and um, are more uh, you know th there's been a lot of you know selection through mortality and things like that. And the ones who are left are uh, you know tend to be motivated to change and experience a lot of health problems. Really different than a, say a 25 year old who has problems with pain medication and alcohol, still feels pretty tough. Um, it, their whole life in front of them, they don't want to stop drinking, for example, at that age, uh, and has been through a lot because we really, I would say, uh, um, you know, exploited uh, military families. By, by the way, I am from a military family. By you know having a very small percentage of families contribute all the the military uh, for for these two wars, and then redeploying them and redeploying them and redeploying them. So they they've been through an awful lot, and. Um, so they're quite they're different than the the, the prior generations. They also have uh, there's far more women uh, in in the military, and the VA was of course designed mostly to serve men. So there's had to be a lot of adaptation around that. And I should say by the way, just for the sake of uh, accuracy, I'm not an official VA spokesperson, so I'm, I can only speak for myself about how I see the, the new vets uh, off the VA. That's important. Yeah. By the way, one of the things that uh, some of our viewers will know and some will not is the the incredible problem with prescription opiate painkillers leading to substance abuse disorders and, and actually the, the overdose deaths now uh, outnumber uh, uh, car accident deaths in the United States and we just have an incredible problem with uh, you know our, if you say what's the most lethal illicit drug problem by some measures it's really it's not heroin or cocaine it's really uh, these prescription medications at this moment which are re really serious challenge yeah, you know, it, it, it overturned something that was widely believed, and I have to say I believed it too, which is that overdoses came mainly from the fact you had an illegal market. So your heroin from day to day, you couldn't guess, you know, how strong is this, and, you know, is my dealer being straight up with me, or is this cut with something? Well, clearly that was wrong, because we see these, you know, professionally made, well-labeled medications leading to more overdoses than heroin has ever killed. Yeah, well, why is that? <coughs> Do we know? Why is that? Um, they're available at a level uh, that heroin could only dream of. I mean, there's more scripts, I believe, written than there are people in the United States. And there's enough there's enough opioids prescribed every year to, you know, to, I think to keep the entire population on Vicodin for two weeks. So it's just, it, it's on a scale that blows away anything that a black market could achieve. And there's probably at least some sense of people feeling they're safe because they are prescribed by doctors and made by, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies. But they are, you know, potentially quite dangerous. The other thing that is, you know, true of, of opioid overdoses is that very often there's also alcohol involved. Um, and that's another, you know, again, example of how the, the, the legal drugs, which again are clearly labeled and we you know about them and all that, in fact, are the ones that are, that are killing uh, far more people. 
You may have heard me um, give this statistic, but when we started the University of Chicago Crime Lab, I and some uh, graduate students went through 200 consecutive uh, homicides, and a third of the victims had high blood alcohol content uh, at the time that they were killed. And, and alcohol was just, uh, you know, it's just an incredibly lethal uh, substance when, uh, you know, in the wrong context. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I've done work in prison inspections and, and a lot of work in criminal justice, and I've seen the same thing. Um, you know, most homicides, most um, physical assault, most sexual assault, there's so, someone is intoxicated. Oftentimes, both the victim and the perpetrator are intoxicated. And that's why, you know, people like our friend Mark Kleiman, um, you know, are, are, you know, always pointing out that the assumption that the link between a substance and crime and incarceration would disappear if things were legalized. It turns out not to be true because alcohol is obviously legal, and yet it puts more people in prison than any other drug. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved in in some work here in uh, Cook County looking at uh, sexual assault issues, and one of the challenges that we have in bringing some of the offenders to justice is that if the victim has imbibed a decent amount of alcohol, it's just it makes it hard to pursue the case and also puts the person in positions of vulnerability that wouldn't have otherwise been in. And uh, so, you know, we could go on. Obviously, this is not a conversation about alcohol, but we should just put the marker down that it could be. Yeah. No, that's an incredibly painful and complicated subject. I actually started in my career doing work in vi preventing violence against women, and alcohol ends up being incredibly painful and complicated because it so quickly turns into victim blaming or offender excusing, um, and it's neither of those things, even though it, it makes violence more likely, but it's your choice to drink, it's, it's, and so you still have to be responsible when you... When, I, I should when say you've also done some research on AA, and I think some folks would be interested to know that, at least according to your research, AA is actually uh, uh, a pretty impressive intervention in some ways. Yeah, you know, I... I don't mind people who are skeptical of AA because when I first heard about it, I thought it sounded kind of hokey. Uh, you know, I was in a I was in a, a medical school and I met an AA member and I was like, "What do you do exactly?" And he said, "We sit around in a room, and we talk about you know spirituality and making amends." And I go, "And, and this is run by a, a psychologist, psychiatrist." He goes, "No, no, there's no one. It's just alcoholics." And I had you know already getting socialized a little into the worst parts of professionalism had a very dismissive. So what, you know, my God, without without someone like me around, how could you possibly cope with anything? You know, it's just, just an attitude that is sadly kind of in in medicine. But as I said, I fortunately I wasn't far enough along in my education that I was incapable of further learning. So I, I was taken to open AA meetings and and cocaine anonymous and narcotics anonymous meetings in Detroit and in Western Michigan, which is where I was going to school. And I thought this is pretty interesting, uh, and I could see that uh, my initial snobbery was not well founded. Uh, and then it was later when I started doing uh, prospective studies with, you know, good majors and uh, you know, done some work at our hospital called Mike Quincipco with actual randomized clinical trials. And lo and behold, it comes out as well or better as do people like me with a lot of letters after their name. So I, I'm quite comfortable recommending, you know, AA to people as something they should try, as well as the other, you know, there's other self-help organizations, but, you know, it, it's incredibly easy to get to, it's motivating, it's more fun, I think, than, than uh, there's more friendship than you might get from a, you know, psychotherapy, something like that. And we're social creatures, and all the evidence we have shows that social ties are good for health, and that's a way to quickly build up some social capital. And I think in the long term, it helps people not just with their drinking, but also with things like, you know, friendship, sometimes job finding happens in AA, uh, you know, finding someone to marry, all that sort of stuff.